words of power because we are kings and our words matter. I'm going to do good like you've never imagined. Why? Because I want that good that I do to them become like a showpiece. Make them a showpiece before the world. I want to change and transform their lives in such a way. I'm going to do good to them in such a way that they will become before the world a showpiece. Offer my life to you Everything I've been through Use it for your glory Lord, I offer my days Sing my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you my Things in the past. Things in the past. Things yet unseen. Wishes and dreams that are yet to come true. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We've been teaching on the kingdom of God. I've been telling you what the kingdom is all about. There is a kingdom that has already come. In a way, the kingdom of God is here, as Jesus said. In what way? At the time of our salvation, we receive Jesus not only as our Savior, but also as our Lord. So, he comes and becomes our Lord and reigns in our lives. And Jesus said, pray in this manner, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom in essence is this, the will of God as it is in heaven is done on this earth in our life. That's what the kingdom is all about. The will of God in heaven 
is done here on earth in our lives. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It has a lot to do with the will of God being done in our lives. Because whenever a kingdom rules over a nation, over a region, their will is imposed there. Whatever they want as policies, they bring it and implement it among the people. They do what they want, basically. That's what a kingdom is all about, a rulership is all about. So when God's kingdom comes in our lives, his will is done in our lives. Now Romans chapter 12 verse 2 is something that we've been reading. That's why I didn't read it this time. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here, again, will of God is being mentioned. But along with that, something else is also mentioned. He said, you need to renew your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may do the will of God or so that you may prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In order to prove the will of God in our lives, live it out. In order to do that, Paul says, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if kingdom has to do with the will of God being done in our lives as it is in heaven, on earth, if that is what the kingdom means, then the will of God cannot be done without being transformed in our mind, us being transformed in our minds. So we've been talking about the transformation of the mind which leads us to do the will of God so that the kingdom can be experienced right now on this earth. This is what we've been talking about. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, let me read to you verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here it's talking about our salvation. Why we are created in Christ Jesus. The expression created in Christ Jesus is about how we are saved. So we are created in Christ Jesus or saved. Why? Paul says for good works. Now a lot of people don't realize this. That they are saved for good works. Like I said last week a lot of people think they are saved to go to heaven. Sorry to disappoint you. You're saved, but you're still here. Why are you still here? You've not gone to heaven. Sure, one day you'll go to heaven, but you're not saved just to go to heaven. That's why this verse is very important. You're saved for good works, it says. That means there are many things that God wants for you to accomplish here on this earth. You're saved for that purpose. You're saved so, they, so that you may live here and do what God has appointed for you to do in your lifetime here. So Christians should not always think about salvation as something that just qualifies us to go to heaven and just keep that our, uh, as our aim. No. Salvation is about getting saved so that we can be now really qualified to carry out the will of God on this earth. Only after you are saved, you are able to know the will of God because you know him. And you're not able to know his will. And then because you belong to him and you are saved, you will do his will. You are saved so that you may do his will on this earth now. So Paul says that very clearly. He says you're saved for good works. And then he says something else. Which God, that is the good works, that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The good works that we are saved to do are good works that have been prepared beforehand. In other words, God prepared the good works that we ought to do and then prepared us. God got the good works ready and then saved us. God always does everything as uh, forethought. There is no afterthought with God. He doesn't bring us on the scene and then scratch his head about what should I give him to do now. He's there, you know. He's not like that because he's God. He doesn't have any afterthought. He always has forethought. He always does everything with a purpose. He decides first and then does. He is always like that because he's God. We are not able to do, always do it like that. But he's always able to because he knows the past, present and future. So God has prepared good works for us to do beforehand. Then only he saved us. 
so before we got saved god has already prepared the good works that we must do these these things are very important for god so when god saves us when god comes to you and saves you and draws you to himself and brings you into salvation through his spirit he's got these good works in mind for you to do that is the purpose for which he saves you and delivers you and gives you a new life and so on so let's keep that in mind there's a lot of things for us to do here on the earth we are here for a purpose and uh, in order to accomplish this for purpose our mind is very important now that mind comes into play very importantly why because mind is given as an instrument like i've been saying it's an instrument what kind of instrument an instrument which helps us to set our goals uh, set our aims and achieve something so a mind has this capacity for dreaming for example a god can share his dreams with us and we can dream with god that we can get god's desires in our hearts god's desires can come in and we can be filled with god's desires motivated by god's desires driven by god's desires we can dream our mind is capable of dreaming uh this is a wonderful tool then dream what see the bible talks about in second corinthians chapter 10 it talks about how we have been given powerful weapons the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds you know by which we bring down every thought that is against christ and bring into captivity every thought that is contrary to christ and so on So it's talking about imagination said every thought and every imagination that is contrary to Christ the imagination is what i'm talking about that's the dream part of the mind so the mind is able to have dreams the mind is able to envision something imagine something and have it as a dream and aim at achieving these things this is how god really shares his dream with us and and literally motivates us Uh, to accomplish the dream in our lives so mind is a place where dreams can be entertained we are dreamers we are meant to be dreamers mind is an instrument that uh, can dream not only that along with that dreaming capacity the mind has other functions also the mind is capable of accommodating wisdom and understanding and knowledge it can function very brilliantly mind is a wonderful thing that god has given to us uh, please turn with me to second chronicles chapter 9 and let me read to you verse 3 and 4 and when the queen of sheba had seen the wisdom of solomon the house that he had built the food on his table the seating of his servants the service of his waiters and their apparel his cup bearers and their apparel and his entry way by which he went up to the house of the lord there was no more spirit in her in other words some translation said no more breath in her she was breathless when she saw the kind of stuff that this man had now what did she see she is a queen she is used to uh, wealth riches and opulence i'm sure she didn't live in a hut you know she comes from a good place also and uh, all this uh, thing these things that solomon had is not altogether new to her i'm sure there are cup bearers in her country that served her and worked in her palace and she had stairways going up and 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 all these expensive stuff around her and so on it is not you now some people think that solomon was living in such opulence and riches that she was breathless just looking at the opulence and riches no she was used to riches and wealth she had everything what was she breathless about what made her breathless when she came and saw solomon see solomon wanted wisdom from god when god gave him wisdom it lifted him and elevated him to such a status that he became a showpiece before the world people uh, he became like a tourist place you know the people wanted to come and see this man and how he ruled and his great wisdom and wanted to hear his lectures and and his great wisdom and so on people were just fascinated by the wisdom that this man had they heard stories about how people came with very difficult problems and very easily he'll give them a solution for it and so on and so they wanted to see that this man he was a tourist place you know his palace and his kingdom and uh, himself 
or something for people to just come and see uh, because of his great wisdom. And that wisdom uh, was manifest in two ways. And I want to talk about that today. Wisdom was manifest in two ways. And one is the creativity that he had and the excellence he had. These are things uh, uh, that he manifested that, could, uh, that showed his wisdom. It is because of his wisdom. So the queen was breathless not because of the stuff that he had, because of the way he handled everything, because of the way he spoke and because of the way he did things, uh, his whole attitude towards everything. She became breathless. She was stunned to see the difference in this man. All the kings had everything, but this king was different. This king to was a totally different man because uh, he had this unusual thing called wisdom and that enabled, to live, enabled him to live in a, at a, on a higher level and he became like a showpiece before the world. And uh, the whole country enjoyed peace and prosperity because this one man had great wisdom. During the time of Solomon, there was such wealth in the nation and such peace in the nation. It was a time of peace and prosperity because of this man Solomon. And that's very important. If one man can make such a big difference for a whole country, one man who's a leader can have wisdom and because of wisdom, whole country can have peace and prosperity. Just imagine what will happen to our homes when one man in the home is like Solomon, stands in the middle of his house as a leader in his house, and uh, conducts the affairs like Solomon. Just imagine the peace and the prosperity that will prevail in that place. It's amazing what one man can do for a whole nation. Uh, but God, you know, that, that's the thing that people came to see, his wisdom. It was amazing. And because of him, the whole nation was experiencing peace and prosperity. And God made him like a showpiece before the world. Everybody came and saw. And uh, the po whole point is that God wants to make the church like that. May God wants to make us like that. Every one of us ought to be like that. That we ought to be like a showpiece before the world. Let me show you some verses here. First, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 33. Verse 9. 33 9. Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all nations of the earth, who shall hear of all the good that I do to them. He's talking about the city of Jerusalem. He says, it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all nations of the earth. Not just the city, but it's talking about basically the people, really. They shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth who shall hear all the good that I do them, do to them. What God is saying is I'm going to do such good to them that when people look at these people, God's people, they will be to my praise and my honor. People will give honor and praise to me. I will be glorified. When people look at them, they will see how good I am, how great I am, and what I have done for them. I'm going to do so much good to them. Uh, this verse is very interesting because verse 8 talks about how he will deal with their sin and guilt and remove it. And then verse 9, it talks about how much good I'm going, God is going to do to them. And because of that, all the nations are going to look at them and uh, they are going to be to the praise and honor of God. They're going to be a name of joy and they're going to bring great joy and praise and honor. So God is going to cleanse their sins, clean away their guilt, and then do so much good to them that uh, when others look at them, uh, you know, that will bring glory and honor to God. Now that's a wonderful picture of what the church ought to be today. Why does God cleanse us from our sins? Why does God remove our guilt? Why sin and guilt are dealt with? You and I, we've been forgiven our sins. He has cleansed us from all our sins and done all of that. According to verse 8, that's what he says he'll do. Why does God do that? So that it can lead to this. So that all the good things they can receive. Because all the good that God can do to them. He can make them his people by removing the sin and guilt. And then do a lot of good to them. 
God doesn't do good because people have been praying and asking for some good to be done. God does good because he's got a purpose, agenda. He says, I'm going to do a whole lot of good. Why? I'm going to do good like you've never imagined. Why? Because I want that good that I do to them become like a showpiece. Make them a showpiece before the world. I want to change and transform their lives in such a way. I'm going to do good to them in such a way that they will become before the world a showpiece. Just imagine that and read the rest of the verse. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it. That is the nations of the world around them will see and they will fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide it. Now this is said in a context where, you know, in the context of the nations of the world that were worshipping various gods and so on. And uh, the prophet is trying to, uh, the God is trying to speak through the prophet and say, say to him, say, say through the prophet this, you know. See, they're worshipping gods that don't have any breath in them, don't have life, they're not able to hear, they're not able to see and so on. Uh, the, those gods cannot do anything to them. Look what I will do. You know, those people in those nations, they worship gods and they have no fear, no they don't tremble before their god because their god is not real. He can't do to them anything to them. They don't have fear and trembling. But when they see me, they're going to fear and tremble because they're going to see that I'm a living God, that I do great things, that I am alive. That's the way God is presenting the whole thing here. So he says, they're going to fear and tremble for all the things that I do to them. Now, this is a true picture of the church. This is what the church is meant to be. The church is meant to be an honor to God. You know, God wants not just to forgive our sins, but to bring us in and to bless us and to do good to us beyond our wildest imagination. Why? Because he's got his own agenda. He's got his own purpose. He's got his own good, acceptable, and perfect will. He says, I've got something in mind. That's why I want to bless. God chose Abraham and blessed him. Abraham didn't pray for blessing. He didn't ask for blessing. He was not looking for blessing. He didn't care about blessing. He didn't know about blessing. God says, I'll bless you. The very opening statement about Abraham, the Bible says, God spoke to him about blessing. Five times in two verses, the word blessing is used in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. I'll bless you. Make your name great. I'll bless those who bless you. Curse those who curse you. In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed and so on. How many times the word blessing and Abraham must have stood there and, my God, what is this blessing, you know? Why does he want to bless me? Why does he want to bless me so much? I didn't ask for it. I didn't pray for it. I didn't fast for it. You know, what's the point of blessing me? See, a lot of people don't understand why God wants to bless us. You know, I've seen people that uh, uh, speak very badly about everything, you know. I remember one time, one fellow criticizing this whole business of healing, you know. So what are you talking about? Healing, you know. You mean God heals today. And the way he talked, it looked like he was just full of spite and he, he was just ridiculing the whole subject of healing, that God heals. Christian, believer, you know. I was thinking, wait till you get sick, brother. Don't have to have a cancer or anything. Just wait till you get a migraine headache. Yeah. For about 10 days from morning to evening, if you get a migraine headache that will split your head, you'll be glad. You'll be glad to go anywhere to get prayed. Somebody pray for you and cast out that headache from you. You'll be very happy to get rid of it. You know, you don't appreciate healing because you're not sick right now. And you're talking theology that somebody talked to you, you know, and said, God doesn't heal nowadays, you know. Health is a wonderful thing. I thank God for health every day. We all need health. If you are sick, what can we do for God? You know, thank God I'm alive. I'm breathing. I'm able to stand. I'm able to preach. I'm able to go places. I'm able to do things. I appreciate health. I thank God for healing. I believe that God heals today. And we all need that. And, uh, and I pray for people's healing. And I believe for people's healing. And I, I'm so happy to hear when somebody says, I'm healed, you know. Uh, I'm all for it. God wishes that everybody gets healed, you know. And I wish everybody gets healed of everything and so on. 
we should never spike these things. We should never take these things very lightly. Uh, because, you know, when Bible says, you know, God brought the people out of Israel, not one among them was weak. I mean, no hospitals, no doctors, not one weak person among the whole Israelites, you know, through the, throughout the whole Israel, uh, wilderness journey. Not one was weak among them. God made sure it's a total health coverage, you know. <laughs> and he brought them into the promised land. Why was he interested in their health? Because he's bringing them, you know, he's the great shepherd, you see. A shepherd must take care of the sheep, feed them well, fatten them up nicely, and make them look good and make them strong so that when you look at the sheep, you know the shepherd is a good man. Amen. Right? <laughs> if the shepherd is fattened and the sheep are thin, then you, <laughs> then you wonder what the shepherd is doing, you know. Same way with pastors. <laughs> a good shepherd is the one that leads the sheep into the good life. See, people must enter into the good life as a result of the shepherd's ministry. To the sheep, you know. The Lord is my light and the rock of my salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I fear? The Lord is my light and the rock of my salvation. Who shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and the rock of my salvation. Salvation. 